Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Kevin Coots from Microsoft Research, and I'm here uh, to introduce Paul Miller, who's joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Paul is here today to discuss the power of technology and the way it is changing and liberating the way we work. He's the author of Mobilizing the Power of What You Know and the Digital Workplace, How Technology is Liberating Work. He's featured in the Wall Street Journal and has been at the heart of the work and technology revolution for the last 20 years. He's also CEO and founder of the Digital Workplace Group. Ephraim Reed will be our interviewer today. Freed will be our interviewer today. He's the community manager for the Internet Benchmarking Forum, or IBF. He spends his time trying to understand the challenges that companies face around building integrated digital workplaces and helping Internet teams deliver better online employee experiences. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Paul, for starters, um, can you tell us again the title of the most recent book you've written? And in a nutshell, what is the book about? Um, well, the book's The Digital Workplace, How Technology is Liberating Work. And um, I suppose both of those parts of it are, are worth, worth commenting about. First of all, what do I mean by the digital workplace? Well, I think for the last 200 years, we've been shaping, understanding uh, physical workplaces, offices, factories, shops, the physical environments where work happens. And I think what's happened around us without us almost noticing is that we've been shaping, um, creating, and living in digital workplaces as well. Mm. So. The, the simple definition of a digital workplace is it's the kind of counterpoint to the physical world of work. I would suggest that work only ever happens in two environments. One's physical and one's digital. Yeah. Um, but I think what's interesting is that the digital world has kind of grown around us without us really noticing. Um, but the, the other point in the, uh, in the book's title, How Technology is Liberating Work, is that I think the impact of the digital workplace is generally a positive thing in the world of work mm. um, for reasons we can go into um, with a few kind of cautionary tales that are, that are also there. Well, before we get uh, too far into this, how do you define the term digital workplace? What exactly does that mean? Well, uh, aside from the, the, the counterpoint yeah. terminology that I just used relative to the physical workplace, it's, it's all of the infrastructure of the digital world. And, you know, it's, I'm a bit loath to sort of try and define what that is while in the headquarters of Microsoft, but it's, it's, it's internet, it's HR systems, it's email, it's microblogging, it's, it's, it's uh, um, teleconferencing. It's, it's the myriad kind of tools that we connect into, the devices that we use. Um, those are the, if you like, are the kind of the parts of the infrastructure of the digital workplace. But my, my, my main way of defining it is, is to say we, we have a physical world of work and it's the digital equivalent mm. or the div digital counterpoint to that. So it's, it's a landscape. It's a digital landscape. And, it, and if I understand correctly, it's something that's kind of emerged, but we maybe haven't shaped it very intentionally. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm not a, a, a technologist, and I'm kind of conscious that the, the audience here knows so much about that. So I'm trying to think about you know, ways of answering the question that try and bring maybe a different kind of um, perspective on it. And I was thinking about this before I came, which was that you know, we, we know when in astrology you, you see a kind of planet, uh, like a little dot on the horizon, and bit by bit it comes closer and closer, and you start to realize that this is... This is another kind of planetary system hmm. that, that we're kind of related to. And I think the digital workplace is kind of emerging like this. It's, it's a planet that's gradually been coming into view. And I think we're not yet sure what size this is. Is it bigger than us on a physical level? Is it similar? And also, what's its relationship kind of gravitationally with, with us? So what's the relationship between the digital worlds that... that the people here uh, are, are, are creating and the physical environments that we're used to working and living in. Yeah. Well, we're about to go down an, uh, a 
fascinating path of discussion here. But before we do, uh, your book is a personal story. And I'm wondering if you can kind of explain why did you write the book and what does this mean from your own, your own history? Well, I mean, I noticed that the Microsoft um, research strapline is, is, is ideas into reality. And, and one of my reasons for, for writing the book is I think it's really important to name things. And I, I noticed that this digital world of, of work was getting very focused around intranets, uh, HR systems, ERM, et cetera. And that actually, I think that the, the world itself, the term itself, and the definition needed kind of naming. Mm. So um, I, I think that was uh, uh, really important. The other thing was it, it really kind of started on my first day back at work, which is in the days before the, the internet and typewriters were around. And I, 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 I started work on an evening newspaper in Newcastle in the north of England. And I arrived in this kind of supposedly dream job and I, I started working and my uh, landlady that night said to me, um, so how did you find your first day of work? And I said it was, you know, it was sort of okay. And she said, well, what? I said, well, I, I just can't get the idea that somebody sort of pays you money, you have to go and sit somewhere. And you, that's where you basically have to reside. And I realized that, um, and I talk about this in the book, that the thing that I was rebelling against, if you like, was the physical constraints around work. That my, my, my objection to what I was doing was not the work itself, which was fundamentally interesting. It was really that it was um, some of the physical restrictions placed around uh, work. And I think one of the implications of the digital workplace is to change where work is located. Mm. So increasingly where work is located is where people choose it to be located. I mean, I know there's a mismatch between where the technology is and where it's going to be, but essentially um, uh, that process of work becoming more portable, more mobile, um, is giving people increasing amounts of autonomy, um, influence over the design of work. So if we, if we go back in time and we look at kind of agricultural times, work was located in fields, villages, farms, and that was the way that we lived. The Industrial Revolution created the arrival of the city, uh, factories, um, and, and the, the arrival of the office. And when my dad was going to work, he had to go to an office because that's where all the tools of work resided. Yeah. Now, now I would suggest that for an awful lot of people, that's no longer the case. And the question is, what does that mean? Um, what, what, what am I going to do with that level of kind of influence and autonomy and, and empowerment? of, of, of people, ooh, um, in, in work. Yeah, this idea of empowerment, um, it, an empowered employee, one who can perhaps work from anywhere because they have the digital tools they need, it kind of suggests maybe a different kind of employee, right? Mm. Corporations maybe look, how, how is the freedom of the digital workplace changing the kind of employees that companies look for? Well, I think, I think the interesting thing is that this is sort of this, this, this kind of explosion of the digital capability in, the, in work um, is coming at the same time that people are arriving in the workplace with a different kind of set of expectations. Mm. So what I'd suggest people coming into the workplace and what I notice is, is that it, they're not really interested in the status of physical space. They're not looking for a bigger office, a larger desk, the name on the placard, but what they are looking for is high quality digital environments and so when they come into the front lobby and they're impressed by what they see they also need to see a di have a digital experience that matches up to that um, and, in, and very few organizations are, are really matching up to that at the moment um, the second thing is that what the younger employees are looking for is more um, uh, influence uh, flexibility um, less kind of managed by input, more management by output. And, and so there's this kind of nice blend going on where the expectations of, of younger workers and what the digital workplace can afford are coming together. Yeah. Um, um, however, I think there's a huge time lag between what people expect on a digital level and what generally in organizations and I don't know whether it's true at Microsoft as well, and sometimes it is in major technology companies, just as true as it is in you know, pharmaceutical companies, engineering companies, that the digital workplace is 
is, can be quite disappointing for people. Interesting. So that, that kind of gets to the point. Over the past few days, we've been uh, getting a, a look at some of the technology Microsoft uses internally, the, the way they've integrated technology in their physical work, workspace. Um, they have easier access to that kind of technology because they're creating it. Uh, so the average you know, Fortune 500 type company, there's large companies out there that are not Microsoft, they're not technology companies. Um, how do they compare to the technology companies that have this technology more readily at hand? What's the difference? What's the, the gap there? Well, the, the gap's not as extreme as you'd think because in a way it doesn't matter whether you're a technology company, I would suggest, or uh, an oil and gas company, you've got a large number of people trying to, with lots of different preferences. Uh, you've got lots of isolation, uh, silos, fragmentation, politics. You've mm. got all the issues of any organization. Um, uh, however, you, you, know, you would expect generally to have a better digital experience. On the other hand, in order to do the work somewhere here, you've got a, a higher level of digital requirement. So it, it's, it's it, that there, there is in, I, I think in all organizations, including you know, Google, Facebook, IBM, that there's a mismatch going on between what people need and what they're, what they're, mm. what they're, what they're getting. And then, you know, we had an interesting um, tour yesterday through the envisioning lab at Microsoft. And I think it's really important that, that the major technology companies are doing what you're doing here, which is thinking about the future and what do we want it to look like. Because I think there's a unique opportunity, really, which is equivalent to what happened post-industrial revolution, which is we need to design the infrastructure. Mm. Um, it, we need to design it at a company level. We need to design it at a government level. Because this is the equivalent, as people have said, of the transport system, the railroad system, the trans the, you know, uh, of, of the industrial age. And, and I think, you know, I see it happening to some extent in, company, in countries like Scandinavia, where maybe because they're a little bit more confined, a, a, a highly educated, smaller or, a group of people. But I think at a government level, we really need to get um, digital infrastructure investment in, mm. into the workplace. And I think what we saw from the Envisioning Lab was fantastic. But, you know, where is, and it's true in my own country in the UK and in the European Union, uh, in the US, where is the government-led policy that says this is part of what is going to make us an efficient, productive com uh, country? You know, that gets to an interesting point. Um, this goes a little bit beyond maybe the, the digital workplace as it applies to companies, but what about digital rights? Do people have a right to bandwidth? Do people have a, it, <laughs> do people have a, a right to access to the internet? Because people uh, historically, maybe they, they feel like they have a right to clean water. Mm. And now you, you mentioned the role of government. Well, what are our digital rights? Well, I think if we start taking this idea that a, there is a physical infrastructure of, of work and living, and there's a digital infrastructure, you would say, I, I think the equivalent would be, yes, yes, they do. Because, I mean, I don't think um, we know of a country where people are banned from using the train system or the bus system. Mm. Um, you know, whether you can afford the ticket, Etc. You know there are issues, yeah. but but you know nobody fundamentally is is prevented from that. Um, yet we do have, you know, effectively kind of digital divides, and I think that weakens uh, weakens uh, countries. But I mean, one of the interesting examples of what happens when you put the power of the digital workplace in the hands of people who don't normally expect to have it is um, there's a clothing chain Zara, which is very popular in Europe. And um, what they discovered was that um, a, a their uh, staff were interacting with their customers a lot. So they started using this as a, a chance for market research. They got smart phone devices in their hands. Somebody buys a dress but says, actually, I'd prefer it in purple. What Zara have been doing is, is bringing back their manufacturing from China back to Spain. Through the, the systems that they've got, they're able to kind of re-engineer and remanufacture very quickly and then a week later it's in the shops in purple. Yeah. Now the empowerment of people in those stores from really quite pedestrian jobs in retail to digitally equip people who can really do some proper work is, is, is fascinating. Same thing happening in, in some hospitals where you're giving people these um, devices 
that are allowing them to kind of track, well, when is the operating theater going to empty? How, what's the, where are the cleaning team up to? What's mm. the turnaround time? It makes people more productive, but it also gives them access to the information. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think those are uh, sort of examples. I, I feel this, this topic, which I talk about as the uh, kind of mobile front line, which are the people in roles that really organizations found hard to reach. You know, postmen, um, uh, shop workers, um, uh, people working in warehouses, etc. People who haven't really connected in digitally into the enterprise. I think it's a fascinating area of, 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 of uh, capability. Yeah, we often uh, think of maybe the digital workplace as uh, something for knowledge workers, people who spend their entire time in front of a computer all day and have access mm. to a keyboard and a big screen. Um, and it, I'm particularly cognizant of this perception of the digital workplace since we're here at Microsoft has made office productivity software for a long time. Um, maybe to talk a little bit about, well, I don't know if this is fair to Microsoft, but uh, what are the biggest challenges around extending the digital workplace to people who aren't in front of computers? Hmm. For those companies that you talked about, like Zara, what are the big challenges they face in extending, uh, involving people on the front lines and the, the, the field level of companies uh, extending the digital workplace to them? Well, I think in a way what's interesting is I think that the focus has been around knowledge workers, but I think what is very interesting um, is what's happening in manufacturing, for instance. So, you know, The Economist ran a 13-page supplement about four months ago called The Third Industrial Age. And it said the biggest change that, the, the, that what I would call the digital workplace is affecting is in manufacturing. So, example, you've got Siemens, um, who've brought back manufacturing to Carolina. Um, that factory is l running lean technology, um, extremely efficient and productive. But what is fascinating is also linked into 350 other locations globally. Hmm. So it, it's a bit like, you know, there are people sitting in the room here, and thank you all for, for coming and listening. There's a whole bunch of other people. We don't know quite who they are, where they are, but we're all part of the same experience. And in a way, we're part of the same conversation. Uh, and I think the changes to manufacturing, you know, with 3D printers, uh, localization of manufacturing, is, is probably going to be more profound than what's going to happen within, let's say, the knowledge-based organizations like PwC, Ernst & Young, who, who I think we've kind of got used to yeah. having you know, access to tools and technology. Um, what happens when you... Um, put engineers, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, equipping people in the field with tablet devices, um, smart technology in their fingertips, the ability to organize their own scheduling. It really kind of lifts groups up that, that, that previously um, weren't. So I, I, I think that's a, a fascinating area. How do you think, as kind of almost the first step forward, how do you think companies can identify the opportunities to extend uh, the digital workplace into their frontline employees? Well, I often say, you know, look at, I um, mean, when we had people from financial services we were with for the last couple of days and, and other organizations, look at what people are doing in the, in the frontline roles in your organization. Um, I mean, you've used the term, Ephraim, of, of workplace anthropologists. You know, study behavior, study what they, supposedly kind of menial tasks yeah. that you're doing if you're a post, postal delivery or if you're um, um, delivering online shopping to people. You know, look at what they're doing and see what the technology can do to make that job more productive but also more fulfilling for them uh, as, as individuals. I mean, I know that um, in uh, one European country they're looking at giving the postman access to the other postmen who are in their region. Uh, you know, in their neighborhood through collaboration tools, huh. online chat facility. You know, so that, you know, instead of you just walking around with the post, you, you've got a chance to connect to the other people. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's, it's really looking at what organizations are doing. Obviously, you know, Microsoft's been doing this for years, trying to think through what does work, what is the shape of work, and, and how can technology facilitate and enable it. And I, and I do think, getting back to this point, that somebody's got to build, the, somebody's got to design the infrastructure and the roadmap. Yeah. Um, because 
what's going to happen is that organizations are going to be acquiring the technology that the major technology companies uh, create. And that's what is going to be deployed, and that's going to what is going to design what works going to ha how it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I think the other I interesting kind of point that sort of just comes into my mind when I'm thinking is that uh, work has always, as I say, been defined by location, and one of the interesting effects of that is it changes the demographics of where people live and how yeah. they live. So if you get back to agricultural times, people lived very locally, uh, worked locally villages, farms, etc. The cities grew up um, out of industrialization. Um, so work being defined by location, I think the interesting question was what happens when work becomes portable, yeah. mobile? Not that people won't come to shared working environments as well, but what about if that starts to become less um, uh, solidified and becomes more fluid, more flexible? And I see a process of kind of localization of work happening and localization of living. So, um, I mean, one of the downsides of having huge facilities that people have to travel to is you, you, you can either only live in a certain radius or you've got that travel. Um, and I think uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers are looking at having few, less footprint of owned real estate but more facilities. Yeah. Um, and I think it also throws up the idea that uh, major organizations might well um, have shared facilities with other major organizations very close to where people live. Mm. And I think that's very powerful for local economies because I spend quite a bit of time in, in the Cotswolds in, in, in uh, the UK, which is kind of what you might call countryside, but it's not really. Because a lot of the economy there is by people earning their money outside of that particular area, right. which I think is, is, is starting to change the demographics which I think will be fascinating to watch. And again, it becomes an issue for, for, for uh, a, a government level. You know, it's fascinating that we're talking about the digital workplace and the digital world, but here you're talking about local economies. Mm. Uh, and it strikes me that as the digital workplace becomes more sophisticated and companies adapt physically, mm. um, there are going to be unexpected consequences. Mm. Are there any of these kind of unexpected consequences you foresee mm. similar to the localization well, of, I of physical mm. work? Well, I think one of the, the sort of uh, kind of concepts I've got in the book is called work stretching. Um, and, and I sort of put it in partly because I, I see elements of this already happening, but I also just want to kind of pose an idea. And that if, if work becomes less kind of directed around physical constraints and becomes more liberated through um, technology. It allows organizations to retain a relationship with people much later in life. So the demographics of the way we're living is that everybody's living in, in Western societies longer. And I can see that trend just happening um, uh, increasingly on a global level. So why, when you leave the organization, should you stop being mean, meaningfully involved in it? Um, one of the examples I have in the book is of a, uh, somebody who's in their late 70s, was working from Shell. He left there about 15 years ago. He works 70 days a year. I think he meets the person he reports to once a year, if that. Mm -hmm. He works virtually mentoring um, people, um, coaching people involved in the area of specialization he has. And so I think you could see this much um, longer um, uh, kind of l relationship between people and work going longer. But I think yeah. the other interesting thing is at what point do organizations like um, Microsoft and other organizations think, you know, we don't want to wait for people to graduate from college before kind of getting our hands on them. What about building up a relationship with them when they're 12, 13 years old? Yeah. Um, in a productive way that is about education and it's about engagement. Uh, and I know that Boeing are doing something like that in the Seattle area. And I, I think this is, people kind of balk when I say this, it's like, oh God, leave my children alone. <laughs> but you know, it's been happening in sport and art for, for, for years. And, and I can't, and, and I think if there are gaps in the education system that are not meeting the needs of children and organizations with the right protocols around it, can build up a meaningful relationship. So I call it work stretching. You know, you could have people starting work on the payroll at 13 years old, running up to 90. Up to 90. Um, um, 
and, and, and another of the kind of potentially sort of liberating aspects, and I suspect the people in the room relate to this, is that um, there's a move from work as kind of what you might call a Protestant work ethic to the hacker work ethic. And by hacker, I mean, I don't mean computer hacking. I mean workers' obligation to work as something that gives you fulfillment and enjoyment and reward. And I think increasing numbers of people expect and want that. And I think if you take even a menial job and you give people some influence and, and, and control over its design, so call centre workers who are able to work some of the time at home, um, uh, some of the examples I mentioned from uh, retail, some of the examples from the, from the postman, you, you start to kind of see this move, which I think is, is happening from a Protestant work ethic, which is work is something you suffered, hmm. to something that actually gives you fulfilment which I think was something that was historically only reserved for, for artists, scientists, people who had a real passion for, yeah. for what they did. Well, it's interesting. Um, we think of a lot of these creative jobs, maybe a graphic designer or a developer or something of that sort, where people, they have a lot of passion about it. But then you think of, well, you know, the, the person who's delivering the mail, it's, a, it's not that creative of a job. But it sounds like the, the extension of the digital workplace can make any job uh, more meaningful, more influential in the design of business, mm. uh, and, um, and more creative. Well, I think it's all around this issue that I've discovered on my first day of work. It's, it's about influence. I, I don't say, you know, you get complete autonomy over how your work happens, but as soon as you can start to influence it and, and have some ability to design it more to suit your, you and your own particular preferences and, and, and style, it, it, it becomes immediately more enjoyable. Plus, I think if you mm. give people more um, access to more knowledge and, and tools and services, as we're finding from smartphones, that is, a, 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 is, is an empowering experience for people. Yeah. So I, I think that's a, a positive. I mean, the book does come with some downsides before, so long as I don't sound like the... Uh, well, this is a perfect moment to right. maybe touch on these. Um, a topic that you... you uh, talk about that really jumped off the page in the book is addiction. Mm. Are we becoming hooked on work? Are we becoming hooked on digital interactions? And it is, how is that potentially a really negative thing? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, we, we, we've sort of all, I'm sure, experienced the whole work life blurring. Where does work end and life begin? And does it matter anymore? Mm. Um, and, I, and I suppose there are, there are two things that are, are, are happening that I notice is that um, because work is becoming more portable and more um, uh, mobile. It allows us to connect into work um, when we choose to. And I think one of the negative sides of this is that people are becoming more and more addicted mm. to connection and work. Um, there was a book, um, I'm not sure who wrote it, it's called Sleeping With My Smartphone. It's, it's this, this whole idea of, you know, you know, a weekend's weekends, a holiday's holidays, is the yeah. evening the evening. Um, does this blurring matter? I think that I think it's important. I think work's important for kind of human value, mm. and I also think not not working is important. Um, and I and I think we have been losing sight of that kind of um, distinction. And I think it's an important one. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, one of the downsides of the this move from the Protestant work ethic to a hacker work ethic is that as work becomes more fulfilling, you want to do it more. <laughs> um, but I, I I do worry that that we're getting into kind of people finding trouble sleeping because they want to update their status, check their email, ring any bells. Um, you know, and, and, and I think it's, it's something that, that over time, I think, can have quite a, quite a corrosive effect. So, you know, do we need a little bit of self-discipline around, you know, when we're switched on and when we're not switched on? You know, you've got people kind of, you know, going off to the, uh, the bathroom just to check their email because they're wife or husband doesn't want to kind of, please, please stop, you know, so. Well, as the CEO of a company with a lot of people who are working remotely with whom you engage only in the digital environment, um, and as a CEO of a company where people could be working 24 seven, mm. no matter where they are, how do, you, how do you try to set a tone or do you try to set a tone of balance? Well, I suppose I've got that other interesting role as, as, a, as a leader up to a point of a small organization with in, in quite a number of different countries and, and I suppose what I do is, is, is I don't expect and want calls in the evening or weekends, emails. Um, I don't do that for other people. 
outside of what I would consider their kind of normal working hours. So we, we have a kind of culture in the company of, of respecting the time when people are, I say we don't need you to be physically present, but we do need you to be digitally, digitally present when you're supposed to be working. Right. So we expect you to have strong you know, internet connection to be able to kind of plug into the digital workplace. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is, is, is say, I know that people have got a life out of work and I've got a life out of work. And, and I, I want to work when I'm working, but I don't want to when I'm not working. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, um, um, it's something up to leadership to set the tone. I mean, I heard a kind of horrifying story of somebody who said it was um, the day before um, Thanksgiving and he just wanted to fire off a bunch of emails just to make sure that people knew he was still there. <laughs> you know, and I thought this is, this is quite a depressing uh, culture. Wow. Um. You know, in this, the extension of the, the digital workplace and the flexibility it offers for working remotely, it means that people could end up not spending any time together physically. So mm. how does the, the digital workplace, the expansion of it, how does that change the, the role of in-person time? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful quote from Timothy Leary, who was Harvard Business Professor and... Uh, kind of internet evangelist, and, and he said in the future, um, physical meetings would become sacred. And I think what he was sort of pointing to was that we've sort of abused kind of physical um, working together. Um, it's been um, something that's been used, kind of overused. Um, but I think it really needs to be something that we have to rethink. And we were seeing today some of the redesigned uh, physical work premises uh, at, at Microsoft. I mean, what I think is that the digital workplace is not in some kind of battle with the physical workplace to replace it. And just to kind of correct one of the things you said, um, the company that I run does meet. We do meet once a month um, in order that people can kind of spend physical time together. And then we use customer gatherings and so on to make sure that people have physical interaction. So we do engineer that. And actually, um, personally, I find that I'd like a little bit more time with my kind of colleagues physically than I, than I get. Um, so so I, I think we're having to rethink for different organizations, how do we want to work together? Do we want people to come together physically every day? And if so, why? And how do we square that with the need for people to have some freedom and, and, and influence over, the, uh, over where they work? Um, I think there are certain groups who like physically to be together, as I understand it, kind of developers, engineers, like that kind of physical proximity to each other. Do they want that all the time? Um, are there some times when they want certain things which they want to do um, in places that suit them? Yeah. Environmentally, there was a great story from um, 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 Zappos. Um, um, and they said that we treat, um, they've reconfigured their off own offices, so it's got a far more collaborative spaces and so on, like they've done here at some parts of Microsoft. But they said the city is our workplace. And um, I think if you can start to um, use it like that, I think one of the kind of downsides has been is that y you either work in an office or you work at home. And I don't think home working is that great. I think it's got its place. But um, we are starting to see this new area of third places, you know, which probably kind of started through Starbucks and we're realizing that everybody's in Starbucks working. Well, guess what? We need to have places that aren't the office and aren't home that we can actually get some work done. And I think there's tremendous business opportunity for kind of people to innovate in that. We're seeing it with mm -hmm. the co-working spaces. Again, they tend to be more of the sort of young startups, um, uh, freelance community, where they just want to kind of be together. I'm looking for something that maybe got a little bit more suitable to kind of corporate organizations as well, you know, where you can swipe in. Um, Regis are doing some interesting things with that. But I think we're going to see some real innovation in, in places where physical work can happen. Um, and I guess, and I don't have an answer to it, you know, we have to ask ourselves in a digital, where the digital workplace becomes so rich and deep and meaningful, what's the impact on the physical workplace? Right. And, and what I notice is that um, the physical's not changing that fast, but the digital's changing incredibly fast. And, it, and, and that's going to reach, it's going to increase its depth, its richness, its capability 
for us as, as individuals. And it's going to make, it's going to put pressure on physical environments to kind of justify what they're there for. Yeah. Well, you know, over the past couple of days, we've gotten to take a look at the different designs of physical space here on the Microsoft mm. campus. Is there anything that stood out to you as an adaptation of the physical space to uh, help the digital workspace operate better or to make sure that the physical is, is evolving at the same rate as the digital? Well, I suppose the collaborative spaces, which are you know, places where people can mingle, um, drop in, seem to me physical manifestations of what we see happening on the internet. So if you look at what's happening in um, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, um, kind of digital environments that we, that we go into to, to connect, then um, I think we're trying to create physical um, kind of um, reflections of those, uh, which, which I think is important. But I also think what we saw today was very interesting, where you're going into physical locations, but the technology's all there. Um, you actually don't need to bring any hardware with you. Mm. It's all in the room, and it's, it, you're able to kind of connect into what you need. And I think that is the kind of aspiration um, for, you know, for the physical workplaces. And I think those, those things were, were, were very interesting. Um, I mean, what I liked, that I saw was happening at Microsoft was the was the some of the experiments there, you know, different kind of pods that have been created, um, different use of of, of, of um, workplaces. Somebody using a desk that's up to here. So you know, we've got a couple of people in the company who turn their desks into treadmills, where they're kind of running underneath the desk, uh, yeah. doing 80 miles of, you know, running each week. Um, bit wacky, but you know, um, I mean, I like working while I'm walking. Yeah, I hadn't realized this. So, you know, but what I need in order to do that is I need to be able to connect into the digital workplace to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, this whole idea of collaborative workspaces and office design shifting from individual offices to more open offices and collaborative, uh, the response I often see is people who need to focus for 90 minutes, they struggle when you can see, the, you know, the heads and you can hear the voices of 20 other people. How, how do people focus in the digital workplace? Whether somebody from you know, anywhere in the world can reach you via instant message if you're working by yourself or whether you're in a, an open office, how do people focus? How does a developer get into the, into the zone, into the flow to finish you know, producing a certain amount of code um, when they could be interrupted by anybody at any time? Well, I mean, I, you know, I suppose work's always been around, you need to have a certain amount of focus um, and, and discipline to, to work. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's sort of like what would happen if, if, if we were expected never to work? You know, work is something that we, we, we have to turn up to do wherever, we, wherever we're doing it. We have to be somewhere physically. So I, I think we probably need to, uh, as individuals, work out, you know, we can't just be interrupted uh, constantly. Yeah. So you, you need to find some space for yourself um, that allows quiet working. Um, I think we've, you know, we've seen this in, in library environments, and um, I think we, we, we probably, as human beings, kind of understand how we need to kind of yeah. um, switch, switch off from some of the, uh, the, the interruptions. I think if I was sort of sitting next to you and interrupting you every two minutes with a, an instant message, you'd probably get kind yeah. of annoyed about it. And, you know. It sounds almost like the, the design of the digital work workspace can take some cues from the design of physical spaces. You mm. said a library, quiet places, places where people can recede from what's going on. Mm. Are there other ways that you see the digital workplace design being influenced by um, designs that have worked well in the physical space? Well, I mean, what's interesting actually is that, that I suppose if you look at the, the whole desktop environment, what we, what um, I'd suggest happened there was that the, the, there was a, a view of what a desk looked like and then it was reflected in a piece of technology. Mm. Um, so the clues came from the physical workplace into the digital workplace. But I think what's interesting, and I'll get to answer your question in a minute, which is where is the pure innovation within the digital workplace? Because the digital workplace does not have the constraints of the physical workplace. It's almost like human beings able to fly. 
you know, we were, we were talking a little bit before about the nature of time in the digital workplace. It's, it, it means something different in a digital environment. So, you know, I can watch a program live. I can watch a program later. Um, I can tune in remotely into something. I can pause, come back to it later. Um, um, I'm able to connect in instantly with people in different countries, wherever, with a very high quality of, you know, voice, VoIP connection. Um, so the, I think what's interesting is to start to think about the digital workplace almost with, almost kind of forgetting about the physical workplace because its, it's, ba its boundaries are, are, are so much wider or possibly mm. limitless. Yeah. Um, and I think this is where I get into this analogy of the planet kind of approaching us. We don't really know what the size of it is. I'm sure that, you know, the people here, uh, you've probably got more insight into what that's going to look like, but I suspect none of us really know what the, what the extent of this transformation um, uh, in work is, gonna, is going to look like. But I do think then there are, you know, some clues. Um, for instance, people do like physically to, to meet. Um, in physical workplaces. So I, I, I think, you know, factoring that in as part of what's happening in, in collaborative environments, um, trying to present um, something that's a far more rich and tangible version of you to me through a digital environment than we've had at the moment yeah. at a lower cost would be something that I would find kind of view, useful. I, I said that in the future in the book, again, it's a rather kind of throwaway statement that part benches would become much sought after, you know, when we have holographic images that replace the teleconferences of today. Yeah. You know, with data that we can kind of pull up, you know, beside us. And the reason why I say park benches is that you can sit there and you can be able to, you know, do what I do, which is have teleconferences sitting on a park bench. But, you know, I, I want so much more of than, than I'm getting at the moment. Well, that's interesting. I think maybe sometimes we think of, um, you know, the digital workplace lets me work from somewhere besides the office. And so then I... I'm not seeing people as much, and people uh, sometimes think, well, we want people to still be in the office so that they're getting that engagement. But I've heard examples where people say that the digital workplace can actually create new types of engagement, can mm. en enhance engagement between people, interaction between people in ways that we wouldn't see that in the physical workspace. Can you think of any examples or, um, or anything that could back that up or refute that kind of idea that the digital could be more interactive than the physical? Well, I mean, um, Jaron Lanier in, in his book, I am, uh, you, are not, you Are Not a Gadget? I Am Not a Gadget? Sorry, I've got the name of the book wrong, but it's Jaron Lanier, who some of you will, will know, talks about um, the ability to connect in globally to a group of people playing the musical instrument that he specializes in, people he could never, ever meet mm. and have meaningful dialogue with them. So something's happening digitally that would be absolutely impossible on a kind of physical level, to have that kind of real time, whenever you wanted access to to um, a, 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 a global community. Um, so, what was the rest of your question, sorry? That's a good. Um, okay. Well, uh, that's actually a good example. But how can the digital uh, offer more interaction, better engagement between people than the physical? Because hmm. I think a lot of people are worried that you lose so much of that when you go from physical to digital. But I've seen examples of where it can, uh, and I think you just made a great example, when, when geography is an issue, mm. then you can't engage physically, mm. but the digital makes it more engaging. Well, I suppose there are things that you're able to do when you're in a digital environment that you can't do if it was a purely physical environment. You're able to access data and information that's, that's, that's there, available to you, um, through shared documents, um, et cetera, anything off the internet. Um, you're able to bring in, I mean, as we do in, in, in the company, we, you know, we, we use um, different video conferencing tools, um, so you're able to connect into people um, without any travel. Um, so I, I, I think that we're already kind of designing those, th those environments. Yeah. Mm. Um, the, related to the digital, I think that maybe, what, what has been the role of, smartphones and mobile technology in the growth and the, the, the rapid growth of the innovation in the digital workplace? Well, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, it used to be the time when people said, well, it's not about the technology. 
But I think the digital workplace, to some large extent, has been about the technology and is about the technology. So I think what we've seen in the last five or so years is really this explosion of, of really powerful technology into people's hands in, in a mobile way. Um, and with you know, in, increased capacity um, um, of internet access, um, better access to Wi-Fi, I think these things have really made a, a, a huge difference and enabled some of the things that were simply impossible um, yeah. in terms of work to, to start to happen. So I, I do think we are starting to see this. Um, but I think, you know, you, you also um, just kind of remembering, you asked one of the questions was about um, some of the other kind of downsides that I think potentially can happen, um, you know, with this shift to the digital workplace. And we talked about this work, work addiction. And I think the other one is around kind of isolation. Mm. You know, and people at IBM have been working, some of them from home for 10 years now. And, and you know, some, some people call IBM, I'm by myself. You know, that, that, that there's, there's a danger that if, I, I've got a section in the book called, Has Anybody Seen Steve? Which is, you know, uh, all of a sudden we introduce workplace flexibility and, and Steve's still doing a great job, it's just nobody's seen him for 18 months. And, and, and what's the loss to the organization? And also what's potentially the loss to Steve? Yeah. And, I, 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 and I find this myself, since we don't have an office. There are some days when I'm <clears throat> uh, either working from home or, or working in a cafe or we you know, use a co-working space, and I just kind of miss the people that I uh, work with. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I think there is a danger of, of, of potential isolation that, that companies on a cultural level need to kind of guard against. So I think it's important to kind of orchestrate you know, opportunities as, as we do yeah. for people to actually you know, work together, be together. Well, what about managers who are, who are managing <laughs> remote teams, people uh, with whom they, they connect digitally? What, what's, what do managers have to do to maintain the connection, to maintain, to, to make it so that those remote employees don't feel like they're isolated? Mm. Well, I mean, there's a real challenge for managers, and I got asked the question at a, at a conference recently, which is, what's the future for managers? And I said, well, there won't be nearly as many of them. You know, I think one of the questions is, in a digital workplace um, environment, do you really need this level of management that we've had? Because I think a lot of what managers have been doing is kind of watching people work. Mm. So I, I want you to come into the office, and then when you're in the office, I want to observe you working. So it's really watching people based on input rather than output. And I think increasingly when people have got some autonomy and flexibility over where and how they work, when you start to manage people based on what they produce and what they deliver, and I don't really care um, how you get there, my role as a manager really changes quite a lot. Hmm. And I think that all the studies and research show that this creates higher levels of productivity, uh, higher levels of trust, I think the organizations and managers who are struggling are ones who fundamentally don't trust the people who report to them. Right. So it's almost like I need to keep my eye on you. And, and I think that's always been a quite a false thing. It's, it's like if somebody looks busy, are they really busy? And if they're busy, is that the same as delivering some value into the organization? So I think the, the, the management grew up through the Industrial Revolution as a way of policing and uh, uh, people, really. Yeah. And I think one of the questions in this transformation to the post-technology world, um, and post-technology, I mean the period after the technology started to settle down, which is probably impossible to imagine, but I think that will happen at some point. Uh, I don't mean it won't continue to evolve, but I think rather like the Industrial Revolution, the key infrastructure of it will be in place. Yeah. Um, um, will we, what will we need? Where will we work? What kinds of people do we need to have working there? What are the roles that they're taking on? And one of the things that um, it makes me think about this also in the book is around the fact that companies are going to employ flu fewer and fewer people. And I'm not sure what the um, statistics are at Microsoft between employees and contractors, but I think you're going to see fewer employees, more contractors, more collaboration with other organizations and, and agencies and third parties. So, so in a way, the workplace for the organization feels a lot more dis distributed yeah. and a lot more fragmented. But also my ability to connect into what you as an employee can connect into 
becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Well, one thing that strikes me, uh, we're here on the Microsoft campus. Uh, Microsoft is made up of a lot of technologists, people who work in technology um, and who think about it every day. What are the most important non-technological concerns that technologists need to really be aware of when it comes to the digital workplace? Well, that, that, would, that would be a, a great question to, to end on. I think we should then open it up to the audience. Yeah. But um, I think the things that I would think that Microsoft should think about is that you've got, really got this in, unbelievable opportunity to start to design this digital workplace of the future and, and create, in a way, the, something that's really going to shape and define wh where people live and how people live. And I think that is a, is a tremendous social opportunity. Mm. Um, I think the, um, the opportunity to actually empower people in frontline roles who haven't really had the same access um, through technology is, is a tremendously um, important opportunity. Um, and, and, and I don't think these opportunities just come along all the time. Mm. I think this is a, a unique kind of period of... Of, of time we're in, where there's a lot of disruption, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future will look like. But it really does, I, I think there's so many parallels with what happened after the you know, agricultural change uh, and then the industrial revolution. And I, and I think we are in that technological revolution. And some people are kind of lucky enough to be able to have a shape in, a role in designing it. And I, and I think um, the people at Microsoft have got an important role to play in that. Wow. Well, on that note, uh, to the people at Microsoft who are here in the room with us, anybody have any questions uh, related to what we've been talking about? Yeah, yeah. please. You spoke for a minute about uh, the, the, the issue of having to re go from wherever you live to wherever you work, mm. and that cities were brought up out of an industrial necessity. How do you reconcile the the notion that we can all sort of stay wherever we've chosen to live and not not go to a common place to work with the 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 indicators that will all more of us will live in cities 20 years from now than we'll live in the country because the natural resource cost is just too high well i think that's a, a it's a fascinating point I, I i see the the regeneration and repopulation of of cities with people living increasingly in cities as part of the localization. So it, it, it's just because it's the countryside, it's, they haven't got a monopoly on local sure. localization. So, so I, I think the fact that um, cities and neighborhoods are getting repopulated um, with people who can live and work and kind of enjoy whatever in, in that particular vicinity, I think is a really positive and quite unexpected kind of consequence that I hadn't quite foreseen. So I've talked about some of this um, adaptation of what happens in the countryside, um, but I think there's something between the city and the countryside that we don't quite yet know the name for, um, which isn't really the countryside and it isn't really the city and it's not the suburbs. Um, 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 I'm just going to throw out there, I wrote down urban localization. Mm. That seems to be what you gentlemen are talking about right now. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Did that answer your question? It does. Okay. Yeah. But how do you deal with the time zones? It's becoming a huge issue. Oh, I love that. On a daily question. basis. I mean, I had 11.30 calls last night, 7.30 mm. calls this morning, another 11 o'clock call yeah. tonight. Because if you only do a global call, mm. the only time where nobody's between midnight and 6 a.m. for us is yeah. 11 to midnight. Yeah. Now, you can do it, right? You can do it at home now. So you can open up your computer and you can do it, but how do you try to balance that out? It seems like it's just going to be a bigger and bigger problem. I'll just repeat that question briefly so that folks who are uh, sure. not here in the room. So when in this you know, world of uh, global uh, teams, global um, uh, colleagues, how do you deal with time zone differences? How do you deal with that stretch time where you know, uh, the, the morning, 8 a.m. for you is midnight for somebody else? I think this is a fascinating question because it's where the digital hits the physical. Um, so is it possible to communicate in real time with somebody who's in the same, in a different time zone, but it's the same time for them? No, that's, that's impossible, isn't it? So I think that's an, a fascinating business opportunity because it's impossible, isn't it? Until somebody somehow 
unlocks the code. Um, I, 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 I don't, so I don't, I don't have an answer to, I don't have an answer to your question, but whoever cracks that is going to make an awful lot of money. Um, I, I, I almost throw it out because I believe that if I say it, it maybe somebody will kind of come up with a solution to this. It, but it, it's one of those kind of the, the digital hits the the physical and the world is a certain rotation. Um, but I also think it's it's. I don't know what the answer is, but I do believe that it's a technological opportunity. Well, just related to that, um, does that sound does that sound crazy? Because you, you know, um, it sort of is, isn't it? And I think it's and you see it a lot with India, where people will work, you know, crazy hours. And that's, it's part of it's because it's the, the twelve hour time zone is virtually impossible to deal with. But that's that's the physical adapting to the digital. Yeah. I'm talking about something that that somehow deals with the point that. Gentleman at the back was talking about. <laughs> works those hours and responds the way I would and interacts the way I would. And mm. I come back the next day and find out what he said. Yeah. Or we get genetically modified caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe this, I, I, don't, I don't know, but it gets into this, this, this point that time is, is different in a digital world um, than it is in a physical world and feels different. You know, our expectations of time are completely different. Seconds feels like hours. You know. I, I just think to that point, I mean, we've, as a company, been sitting on the tool that addresses this problem better than any other, and it's, it's email. The problem is, the problem is synchronicity versus asynchronicity, right? right? And we, as a company, have completely bastardized the single most valuable part of email, which is, I can send it, and you don't have to know until you choose to, right? <laughs> we use Exchange like an IM client. That's not what it's there for. So, so to your point, the, like, the, I think the only rational solution is you have to look at the landscape of the work that needs to be done and say, how do we shrink the footprint of when we need synchronicity? Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. Uh, I'll just pile on to that because I think the same, the same notion comes in when you're talking about the physical workspace and the, and the notion of having face-to-face -face time as being something that's both temporal and physical. And yet what that ends up happening is that we take advantage of the time that we're co-located with people to have meetings when, when they're not necessary. So I think we are still in a state of flux where we have all these tools. We have face-to-face mm. -face meetings. We have asynchronous mm. email. We have instant messaging and online mm. meetings. And we're not using the best tool for the job. Mm. And so it tends to sort of expand to fit, fill the time that we have. But it also gets to this idea that I have of this planet arriving that we're trying to get the terrain of. And, and we don't really understand the geography of it yet. So what is the dip? I mean, the, the terms are synchronous and asynchronous, which what, what are the what is the nature? What are the kind of modes and formats in this in this digital world? Which ones require this, this synchronicity, why do they require it, which ones don't, how, do we do, how does that happen effortlessly? We need to start to chart this, this, this uh, territory, which is why I think it's important to name it. Because I think almost when I start to talk like this, I hope that we can start to see this world around us. I think if we could actually visibly see it, it would feel a lot more tangible to us. The physical, we, 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 we're so used to. Um, but I also think just kind of picking up what you said was that, um, you know, in the Olympic opening ceremony, when they did the Industrial Revolution piece, they talked about pandemonium. It was pandemonium for 20 or 30 years. Some version of chaos, you know, uh, disruption, change, where am I supposed to be, where am I supposed to be, et cetera. And I think we're in some kind of um, version of that. So I tell companies not to panic. It's, you don't need to resolve this today, but, but, you, but we do need to resolve it. The, the, the analogy is when I remember email coming to the fore, I had to explain to my father that you didn't need to sit down and write a 10-page email, that you could use email for much more succinct things. Mm. And at the same time, now on the receiving end of it, my daughter's primary mode of communication is instant messaging. Mm. And so she'll instant message me several times during the day of things mm. that are not of an instant nature. She <laughs> could tell me later, she could send me an email, but you know, I just fed the cat, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's one of these, I think it's, it's also a generational aspect or, or coming to terms mm. with the technology. Yes. Yeah. Questions? Are yeah. there other trends you see coming from children of this age? I mean, I, I, one of the other ones I notice is music. 
they don't buy albums anymore. In fact, the concept of an album is foreign to them. They buy songs. They, mm. they don't have lengthy discussions. They have these chats. And so it seems like their moments are sinking, whether it be music or interactions. Are there other trends that you're seeing from that age group? Do you want to repeat the question? Yeah, the question is um, the way that younger generations, kids these days, uh, are communicating it's in these short bursts and uh, maybe to link back to what you said that they, they don't necessarily have a sense of what needs to be synchronously communicated versus asynchronously and if if young people are communicating in these little itty bitty bits well what are the other similar kinds of trends that we're seeing related to the digital working and young gener new generations well I think one of the in one of the, for the fascinating things and I've seen this um, with one of my teenage daughters and some of her friends is, is, is to some extent, a switching off from technology. Um, and by that mean, they, they, they sort of, the penny seems to be dropping that the technology is, is driving them. And, and, and a certain level of kind of frustration and disempowerment for, coming from that. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that they're, they're switching off completely, but they're choosing to kind of leave you know, phones downstairs while they go upstairs not check into Facebook that evening. Um, and, and I think there's a bit of a backlash um, coming up that says, who's, it, who's in charge? Because uh, we always assume that, people, that, that younger people just become more and more deeply immersed in technology constantly. Um, I, I, I see something that might be a counter to that, which is, a, which is trying to get some kind of control or influence over the, the machine. Um, so I think that's, that's something that surprised me. For me, the, the generational thing that makes the biggest difference is, is as, as I say to all my friends outside of the company, you've never heard of it, but if you had free busy for your personal life, mm -hmm. things would get a lot easier. Like the, it's, it's a thing that our software makes a part of our lives so much easier in doing this job that you do not understand unless it's given to you. It's, it's one of the tools that just says, let's have the computer determine mm. when the best time for us to share time would be, yeah. as mm. opposed to the back and forth that's required in order to negotiate that. Mm. I'm just going to repeat that briefly for folks that may be watching. This idea that uh, the Microsoft technology has this simple basic concept of free busy. Right? And if I'm busy, then you, know, you can't reach me right now, or you can't interrupt me right now, or something like that. And what if we had that? Future looking is the important thing. And it's future looking. If I want to have lunch with you, I, the software will tell me when's the next available time he has for lunch. And what if we extended that into the, the uh, consumer realm right. better? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, yes, yeah, sorry. Well, and one thing along that, though, is we need to start adding new parts into that, because it's now. Because it used to be you're in the office, you're free, you're busy. Right. But now at noon, you have no idea where that person is going to be necessarily for your business. Right. Right? I'm free at home, I'm free traveling, I'm free at the office. I mean, one, what, you need to start adapting those things to yeah. their physical location where they're at. Yeah, yeah. And one of just thinking, one of the uh, points that we haven't covered is, which is interesting, is that obviously there's also kind of mega trends sitting on top of this, and there's a, you know, the, the whole environmental impact and the need to um, conserve energy and to have that orientation feeds into the digital workplace. So we're trying to extract the greatest value from the least kind of energy. And, and I think that that is one of those things, it's a bit like the changing expectations of people coming into the workplace. It's something that really, um, I think, kind of correlates with what's happening. I'm not saying that digital workplace doesn't take energy, of course it does, but <clears throat> I think some of the things that we sort of abused on an energy level change. Yeah. I just to that point remind you there's a paper written a few years ago by the New Economics Foundation that argued whether or not we need a 21 hour work week. I, I, and one, yeah. of, one of their mm. three strong points is there's a natural resource drain that was required for the mm. Industrial Revolution mm. to provide us what, it's, what, what we now have. It's not required anymore, right? And so, then what I was going to ask is your your thought on their core posit, which is, would you, how many people would opt to take half the money for working 21 hours as mm. opposed? To well, I think it's it 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 that maybe I'll repeat yes, the question sorry. real quick. Yeah. Uh, there, there's this idea out there that 
let's see if I can get this right, repeating it, that um, the 40-hour work week was uh, designed around resource constraints. Do, do I have that? It's, it was an industrial construct that said, in order to produce enough widgets to feed a yeah. growing market, we have to run factories 40 hours per week, which means we have to have this many human beings, which means Ooh. they have to work this many hours. Ooh. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so w if, if there is a, a new 21-hour work week, will people be willing to work half the time for mm -hmm. half the money? Will people be flexible to that? And does that rebalance the natural resource need? Yeah, well, I, I think, in a way, everything's up for grabs because what do we, it's a bit like what do we mean by work? So if you're unemployed, at what point, how much work do you need to get in order to be, a, to be working? Five hours a week? An hour a week? Ten hours a week? Um, obviously, it, it gets related to what you're getting paid for it, but I think the, 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 work, w the working week will not just continue. It's probably already starting to fragment anyway. Um, I think some of these ideas of, of kind of micro jobs, of, of project-based work, of reduced kind of work. I mean, we've got an issue with some people working 80 hours a week and some people with no work at all. So there's, a, there's this mismatch between what's happening. And, and these things are all un, unsustainable. You know, if we want to, you know, you go to Scandinavia. I was sitting next to somebody from Norway. And it's almost listening to somebody from Norway is like listening to the best practice. It's like if the world run, ran like Norway, it would be so good, uh, I suppose. Um, I'm sure there's some downsides with Norway. But anyway, um, they, they, you know, they see uh, you know, people having, I, I think we need to start to think uh, you know, on a kind of global level about what is sustainable. And I think there is a certain amount of work required, and there are people. And um, we've got a certain format for it, which is the 40-hour week. So I think that's a fascinating article, that, yeah. Yeah, another aspect of that is what, for example, Netflix is doing, where they're not counting any more vacation, for example. So they're saying, OK, if you need to take time off for any reason, you just go and do it, because we want you to be productive. So if you need to take time off, just, just go and do it. And mm. they don't count. And they, they, the whole idea of you know, vacation and work time, I think, blurs and then disappears in the digital. So mm. I think companies need to adapt about that. And it's not about counting 21 or 40. I think it's more about what is the output. I think that, that, that is more the measure that probably we need to have. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think absolutely. And then, you know, this whole switch from output to inputs, is very, that's a very threatening idea to an awful lot of companies and to an awful lot of people. But again, I think these changes require a bit of evolution, a bit of time. But what's fascinating is the number of different aspects of, of the way we live that we've talked about all, all, all around this subject of the digital workplace. Because you change the way people work, you, you, you change the way we live. Good. Yes? And I'm curious, we, we talked a bit about the, the time zone problem, but uh, um, uh, based on you know, kind of your research experience, are there any other tools that you think a company like Microsoft should be developing for the digital workplace? Yeah. Or even in that enterprise market, but you know, mm. thinking about how to extend that or problems you see in your company that you think you know, could be solved by technology? Well, I, I think the, the kind of... Can I repeat that real quick? Yeah, sorry. So um, that was, uh, we talked about the time zone problem. Uh, are there any other examples of problems that enterprises face related to the digital workplace that Microsoft maybe should be or could be looking into? Well, I think the, the, the quality of um, kind of real-time interaction between human beings in a digital environment could be much, much better than it is. So, so I would say that the audio quality is, is, is now with VoIP is, is, is first class. But my actual experience of, of, of you when I'm talking to you. My, my voice will hear your voice like I can hear it now. But my experience of you will be m very, very inferior. And so that, I think, is... And it's not just about video conferencing. I think it's, I think it's something much more um, tactile, something much richer, something much more uh, visceral. Um, and, and I don't know what that is, but I, I think there's a, a, a huge... Um, uh, need for that, and I think it would um, really remove a lot of the 
um, uh, unnecessary kind of physical meetings that take place. I think there's sometimes when we do need to meet, um, but that that would be um, um, you know particular area. Um, I'm just kind of wondering are, are there other subjects? It's great, isn't it? It's like a wish list. What would you like? <laughs> um, well, I suppose people are looking for things that are going to really do the work for them. They're kind of inundated with, as you know, people are inundated with this flow of technology, information, services, and they really want this kind of sense of, you know, something intuitive that really kind of effortlessly takes them, um, uh, navigates for them. The other thing is much, much better user experience. So people want to navigate through the digital workplace. The digital world of work in virtually any organization is like going into that door, finding it's locked, going to that door, realizing you've got to crawl in through the roof. It's, 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 it's very disconnected. It's very imperfect. And I think what we want to have is something that feels as natural as walking through a you know, pleasurable building, hotel. You know, and, and, and so I think that would, again, be something that I think is, is very uh, powerful for people. Yeah. So the digital workplace, in many respects, has inundated us with more information than we've mm. ever seen before and have the opportunity to consume as we make decisions. Have you seen any good examples out there and how people are able to filter through that and get to concise decisions or answers using that information versus being inundated with it? So if I can restate the question, uh, the digital workplace has led to this huge influx of information, more than we've ever had before. And have you seen examples of people who are able to filter through it effectively so that they're able to make decisions uh, without being overwhelmed by this flow of information, but really getting what they need when they need it? Not really, no. Um, I, I, I'd, like to kind of, I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of come up with some really good examples, but um, I can't really, nothing, nothing specific kind of, comes to mind. I think I keep coming back to this mobile front line where there's a kind of some intelligent thinking going on that drives information to people at the point where they require it, um, which I think has got some clues in. There was an um, example, um, you know, I think I might have mentioned it earlier about the Swedish rail system giving people information who are running the rail system out in the field um, that actually enables them to be better informed than their customers because it, it used to be the other way around. So I, I, I think that th those examples kind of come to mind. I, I, I haven't really seen much in the way of kind of management decision making tools that, that really kind of um, simplify things. I suppose you see on the internet, you know, tools that aggregating things that you're interested in, you know, intuitive search, et cetera. It was actually an interesting example. It was a way to kind of tie into that social feedback and be able to almost in relatively real time adjust to the economics of the decisions consumers were making around that. I've heard of similar scenarios around media in terms of movies. Mm. And the, the real time feedback that they get through social networks helps them quickly understand what they should be doing relative to marketing or advertising for that movie based on immediate feedback coming from consumers who had seen it right away. So it's just that harnessing that power of the information out there to be able to con you know, concisely make decisions. Mm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like this overflow of information is, is, and our inability to cope with it very well is part of this, um, this uh, analogy to the Industrial Revolution that you talked about. Mm. You know, there's a 20 to 30 year mm. period of what in the heck is going on. Yeah. Well, this, this overflow of information, this excess, is kind of maybe representative of, the, of us being in that same type of period. Mm. Yeah, and, and, and obviously reflects yet another huge business opportunity. I and mean, I also really like the, the points you've referenced about tools that you've developed here in the past that really have somehow kind of got neglected or derided or whatever, but actually have got some characteristics in there that actually are required in, in the future. Mm. Looks like we've got one more. Do you go in, um, I think information overload is a, is a very important uh, 
question. Do you go into your into any depth um, in your book about um, distraction and discipline um, in work and really focusing in on because if, if you know if you're back in your newspaper company um, in Newcastle and you can work wherever you want, um, where are you going to get the, the discipline? Who's going to teach you the discipline to, to not you know, spend every minute watching Alan Shearer? Mm. So just to repeat the question, um, it, does the book mention the idea of, uh, of discipline and concentration and focus mm. uh, in the digital workplace? Well, I think, I think actually for, for people at the age that I was when I started in, on, the, on that newspaper, I needed some training and I needed some kind of um, o oversight. So, so my, my objection was not really that I wanted to kind of leave that office then because I think I would have come and wanted to be with people and I actually got sent, interestingly enough, to a kind of district office and I was kind of mentored by somebody there so I did get a lot more kind of, um, um, uh, you know, freedom from, from that. Um, so, um, the other part, what was your... Uh, it's just, I mean, discipline, how do we... Oh, the discipline, yeah. I, how do we, we can... Yeah, the, the, wherever we are and, and have the option of working, what, why do we choose the option of working? Is, is uh, technology liberating us or is right. it distracting us to the point that we are slaves to it? Well, I, I've got a little bit in the book about it. I, I think that where a lot of people are is a bit like kind of toddlers with sort of toys. They'll just play with the toy until, you know, they get kind of bored with it. And I think we really need to just kind of mature with the, with the technology just because it's ubiquitous, just because it's permanently there, just because it's 24-7. We need to develop our own disciplines. I mean, I've had 30 years of really kind of regulating my own work by some kind of strange journey of work that I've been on. Uh, and and I've, I've, I've found that what worked for me was to have more de delineation between the working day and the evening, the weekends, holidays, and so on. So I, I developed my own kind of practices around that um, that, that work for me, but I think a lot of people now are kind of, oh my God, I can do it, I can work when I'm skiing. Well, so what? You know, I think, so it's, it's probably a maturing going on. Is there a particular ritual you go through to stop your work day and start your, your other life? No. I just sort of, about 5.30, it's like, that's enough, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I... I used to have, uh, um, not really, no, no. I, 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 people tell me I'm quite odd that I can kind of get deeply passionate about something and then go on holiday and kind of completely forget what the digital workplace is. And so two weeks later I have to go, what, what do I do? You know, and then, so don't know if there's any lessons in that or not. On that note, we're going to try for a graceful exit at this point and shut down. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Paul Miller and Ephraim Freed. <laughs>